Hi there. Uh, welcome to Gibson's Caring Corner. Today we're going to go over a topic of how to choose a caregiver. Well, a lot of people, whenever they need a caregiver, they're not quite sure where to start. So where do we think that they may go looking for that caregiver? So uh, a lot of a lot of times they want to look at an individual. They want to look at the neighbor. They may want to put an ad in the paper or on YouTube or somewhere to hunt an individual. Some ask their local doctor. Some ask people at their church. Some churches even have caregivers of their own that, they, that the community utilizes. So right. there's many choices. So where to start is important and things to think of. So we're going to share with you some things that you should consider before you choose the caregiver for your loved one. That's right. So one of the questions I get is, has the caregiver been trained? Does the caregiver receive ongoing training? So, yeah, again, Creighton and I, we own a local franchise, Home Instead. And with that, we're very proud of the training that we offer for our employees. We have over 600 classes that are organized through a digital system that our corporate office makes sure that we have the right training. And that's important when you have a nurse that goes out and signs up a client and learns about their condition. She can make sure that the caregivers have the digital training they need. And she also checks off the skills to make sure they have the right skill set to provide the care. That's right. So some of the other questions we get is, does the caregiver have special training in Alzheimer's or dementia? I would say, Creighton, I'm sure you would agree that probably 90% of the clients that we work with have some type of dementia or Alzheimer's. It's a big, big disease, and yeah. a lot of people need a little help remembering. That's right. Uh, other things are, have the caregiver had criminal background checks? Our organization makes sure that we do background checks and drug screening. Mm -hmm. And if you are using an individual, how you know, should you trust if they bring their own background check to you? I, I don't know. That sounds a little, a little strange to me um, to have someone to bring their own drug test or their own background check. But um, yeah, that would be a big risk. And oh, I forgot to mention our Alzheimer's, we have you know, a dedicated training for Alzheimer's. Yeah. And there's even a, co a connection with um, Seth Rogen's foundation, the actor, um, with Hilarity for Charity. So he's funded several of our clients, yeah. and they've funded clients across the globe that, um, that have Alzheimer's. So if you have a serious need for help of funding and your loved one has Alzheimer's, check out their foundation. That's right. So other questions that we get, um, does the agency or registry, how do you send caregivers in if one gets sick? How do you do a backup? Great question. So if you're using an individual down the street, that individual, you're going to have to just go by their schedule. You are required in the state of North Carolina, if it's more than one person, to be a licensed home care agency. So with that being said, they would not be able to supply a backup. Um, you would have to just go by their schedule. So if they had children and they were available nine to two, then you would only have care nine to two. If they got sick, then there would not be a replacement. So those are some key things if you were looking for an individual caregiver. Now, for an agency, they would have, we have hundreds of caregivers mm -hmm. on our, because we're, we're, we're a community that has a population, a total population in the county, about 170,000. In big cities, it might be thousands of caregivers to choose from. But we have enough caregivers that if someone calls out sick, we have the ability to replace that caregiver and schedule it if it's a planned vacation. Yeah, our employees need that time off as well. They need to go on vacation. They need to they have their right. doctor's appointments and take care of their families. So we encourage that, and then we have replacement caregivers whenever they have that need to be off. Right. Other questions I get is, well, what kind of restrictions does your caregivers have when they come into the home? 
restrictions. Hmm. Let's see. Um, the first restrictions I think of are our employees are restricted to be professional. Uh, you would think that would just be common sense, but you know, we are there to provide care for our clients. Um, so we want them to only share what they need to um, with the family that would be, that would lift them for the day, give a positive work environment. And if there's any issues whatsoever with the care, then they have the ability to reach out to a nurse through our office or our office staff to get help with the care that might be needed. So what other restrictions or guidelines do we have? I know we have a weight limit. Oh, yes. That's a big one. They cannot lift over 25 pounds. And I like to call that the no lift policy. So um, believe it or not, people will call and say, well, I just need you to pick up my mom and lift them and just move them from this place to the next. Mm -hmm. Well, that is not good for, for the employee. You don't see people just doing that in the hospitals or facilities. And so you should not do that at home as well. It's a big risk to the client. The, the patient is a big risk to the employee. So there are mechanical things like mechanical lifts, Hoyer lifts, sit to stand lifts, lots lifts of lots of lifts available. Yeah. That was a tongue twister um, for us to provide care. So that is key. But um, someone down the street that's providing care may not understand that. And they may try to help lift someone and actually get hurt. Right. Um, and you do not want someone that, you know, someone to get hurt in your home providing care. And let's say they have children and they're at school. Well, then they can no longer be the mom to that child because now they're hurt and they need help themselves to, to take care of their, them, themselves. So that's key. We, we need to be safe. And and you start looking at individuals, you want to know if they're bonded or insured or are are they covered if they get hurt. So what does that mean, bonding? All right, so our employees have a 50,000 blanket bond. So everybody um, is covered for $50,000. So that means if for some crazy reason that $50,000 is stolen, of something, mm -hmm. then that bond protects the person um, that the caregiver is providing care for. Right. So the individual down the street would not have that. Um, and that bond is, is important. And so it's important for the safety of the household, the client, and the caregiver. It protects them as well. So another question that I get is, Who's responsible for the scheduling of a caregiver or the backup caregiver? Well, I'm going to tell you that the hardest job in our office is scheduling. Yeah. We currently have two full-time schedulers and we're hiring a third. Right. So making sure that the right person, the right caregiver, care professional is with mm -hmm. the right client is very important and that you have an ongoing schedule. And with our organization, something called telephony is in place. So you have a digital portal and all family can see the schedule. You can see a picture of the caregiver. You can read the nurse's plan of care. You can see them clock in and clock out. And you have, you know, just hands on knowing what's happening in the home. And you can actually see the task as the care professional completes them. They, they use their smartphone and they can just mark them off as they go. Mm -hmm. It's a really nice setup. And you would not have that ability with an individual, but right. you would with an agency. It's very transparent. Maybe not all agencies, but having that would be nice. So make sure you ask about it. So other questions are how much flexibility would we have in scheduling services? And also who's responsible? So the responsibility starts with the family with us knowing what type of schedule they need. So if we need 24 seven, or if we need seven days a week, a few hours a day, what do we need? So it starts there. And then once that schedule is agreed upon between the family, the client, the agency, then it's up to us to make it all come together. So we can do that um, with the help of our nurse, our service coordinators, our our HR and training with our caregivers, and it is like a, a well-working organization to get that schedule completed. Right. So that's some of the questions that we, we have had. 
we wanted to share, but we want to move on to the next segment. And with that being said, one thing that I want to leave you with is it's always important to look at someone's rating. Look at their Google ratings. Look at their caring.com ratings. Make sure that they look great because you don't want to just choose anyone. And that would be another place. And as Creighton said, we're excited for the next segment, segment which is Kale Jordan. And he's going to teach us some more information with health and nutrition. Yeah. Hope you have a great day. Hi, welcome back to Health Tip with uh, Gibson's Caring Corner. I'm Kel Jordan, and I'm here to, today to share with you about why nutrition um, plays a really important role in our mental health overall in our lives. Um, so a proper diet can really just save us time, and it can also help us with our stress management and any other mental health issues that we really have. And so when you're a caregiver or you are a new patient, whether you're an elderly and your family's finding a new caregiver or you're the family trying to find a caregiver for a loved one. It can really be stressful. And so nutrition can actually play a really big part on helping to reduce and manage that stress just a bit. And so today, well, last week, we kind of mentioned uh, the food journal. And so why did I do that? Why did I mention food journal? What, what purpose does that really have? Well, the food journal is really a great way to help us kind of keep track of how, how we eat, what we eat, kind of our understanding for our eating habits. So if you really want to create a new habit to eat better, eat healthier, to either lose weight, manage stress, have more energy, or feel better just overall and have a higher quality of life, creating that food journal is really a great way to get started. And so with the food journal, it's kind of like a monthly budget. Um, if you look at, if you think about it, you can't actually create a monthly budget without actually going back and looking at where you spent your money or where you're getting your income from. Um, because if we just decide not to look at those things and we decide to continuously spend our money on things, then we're going to always fall short of our goals. And so creating that monthly or not the monthly budget, but creating our food log is very much like that monthly budget. It's allowing us to see where we are and being able to see where we want to go to and helping us get from point A to point B. And so why, so a lot of you might be asking, okay, well, a food journal sounds great and all, but what if I don't want to lose weight? What if I'm happy where I'm at? Well, let me ask you this. Why do we actually need food in the first place? And so there's a couple resources here I have with, with me today. Um, one is the Nutrition Family Guide by Ann Burgess and Peter Glassauer. Um, they're saying food is something that provides nutrient, nutrients, and nutrients are substances that provide energy for activity, um, growth, and functions such as breathing, digesting foods, staying warm. It also helps with materials for body growth and repair and also helping keep the immune system healthy. Another Australian health and well-being uh, medic clinic even goes on to say, nutrition means getting the food and nourishment that you need for health and growth. Without it, we are weak, sick, could die. Uh, we could miss developmental milestones and can't perform the daily and mental fun er, and physical tasks that we need to do. Um, we aren't able to grow and we aren't able to reproduce. And so with that, it's just kind of leading on. Okay, so nutrition is really important because without it, without the food that we have, we can't perform how we want to. We can't think the way we really want to think. We can't be there for, the lo for our loved ones. Things might be stressful, but with the proper nutrition, if things could actually be a little bit better. Maybe we'd have more energy or have a, a um, better mental focus. And so from there, we can kind of go on and say that, okay, well, food gives us nutrients. Great. But nutrients also, in turn, gives us energy, helps us to provide resources to function, to grow, repair itself, repair the body, and to reproduce. And from there, um, food... We can also say from the Australian Medic Clinic that the foods actually really do help to directly impact our overall well-being, both physical and mental, and indirectly will focus other 
well-being areas that we talked about last week, such as your spiritual, your emotional, your social, your environmental. There are some other studies here that kind of go to prove this a little bit. So I have a study here from Cambridge study published in 2017 that goes on to say a highly processed diet is actually leading people to be more at risk for depression and anxiety. They also go on to say that Alzheimer's and depression are often found with obesity and that things such as dementia and Alzheimer's might actually be able to be um, prevented um, with nutrition. So things that we thought previously that were things that just happened because it happened might actually be able to be, be prevented from proper nutrition. Another study published in 2021 actually goes on to talk about the nutrition and mental health balance. They actually went on to say that nutrition does play a very critical role in the overall well-being and the mental aspects of individuals. And so I want to kind of go and close out and say that being, being in a caregiving position, whether you're a family or you're a worker or you're a friend, or if you're looking for a caregiver for a loved one, or maybe you're going to be a new patient as a, um, for a caregiver, maybe your family has found a caregiver for you, this can all be very stressful. And so taking in the proper nutrition with these things can really kind of help mitigate those just a little bit, make things a little bit easier on our body. And so I want to really just kind of close out and say for this next week, I want to congratulate those that decided to partake in the food log. And I want to ask you to continue with the food log, try and see if you can't do better this week than what you did last week. Maybe this week you will do four days instead of three days or five days instead of four. Um, but really just try and focus in on making sure that you kind of take a picture or you write down the foods at the time that you start to eat them. And if you can't really do that, then make sure you take a picture of all the foods that you eat when you eat them. That way at later that day, you can actually go through and write them down. If you have a smartphone, there are apps you can take or partake in, which are like my fitness pal or my personal favorite, which is chronometer. And with those, they will actually kind of help you see your nutrients that you're taking in. And they'll also help kind of keep everything organized as far as what you're eating and when you're eating everything too. And so I would really like to encourage people to continue with your food log. That way we can really try and make a new habit. That way we can make things a little bit easier on our lives and not trying to um, constantly fight battles when we could actually resource ourselves with the nutrients and the supplements and the resources that we can have at hand. I mean, if we're going to be spending money on food, might as well spend money on food that's going to help us and not hurt us. And thank you very much. This will be back to uh, Creighton and Tracy. Thank you, Kale. And now, if you're remembering, last week I told you about we're going to have a story time. And today we're going to talk some more about Elizabeth Ann Reinhardt. March 20, 1933 is the year. And this is in the community of Mooresville, North Carolina. And here's her story. Can you imagine what a family of nine children a father, mother, grandfather would think and feel upon finding another mouth to feed, clothe, educate, and care for, a child being born, adding to the family, a real black sheep to share a name with them. That's what happened when I was born March 20th of 1933. The memories of youth are everlasting and become richer with the flight of time. Growing older makes the images of childhood more vivid. Childhood experiences keep a warm, rich memory of one's past. Sometimes I like to think of yesterday, the episodes that shaped my childhood. I remember life as being uncomplicated, peaceful, and serene, always dreaming of the future, sitting on a cotton-picking sack, gazing at big old fluffy clouds drifting by. Those dreams and acclamations of experience have made life worthwhile. Getting to go to the fishing hole with John Blaine was a real treat until we got to the bank of the pond and he would not allow me to speak a single word or even make a sound when he fixed his line with the sinker and hook wrapped around a cork. 
He used a limb for a pole. He used worms, fat back meat, corn, or bread for bait. When squirrel hunting, then squirrel hunting, that was another story. Skinning the squirrels and rabbits out back at the big locust tree. Two tenpenny nails were driven into the tree to hang the game by its legs so I could skin, cut, and gut, gut it ready for cooking. Dad was the quail hunter, always keeping good pointers and setters. Old Red Sport was his last setter. Dad gave him to his friend in town. At night, we sat at the porch listening to Bob White's crickets and frogs. We could hear Sport barking. At night in winter, when Dad went hunting, he would wait to after supper and put newspapers on the floor in the fire room or family room and dress the quail. We kids sat around thinking of that delicious flavor and taste as he barbecued them on fork sticks he would cut and sharpen for roasting, using the flat irons to prop the quail close to the blaze in the fireplace. Can you remember how small a quail wing is? After roasting it, you must use a magnifying glass just to sit behind it, and that's approximately the amount of birds you would get as your share. <laughs> it reminds me of a story Granddad Reinhardt would tell us about his own pranks of his youth. This story goes, and he said, Three friends went hunting. Now, this would have been like in the 1870s. They got six quail among them and decided they were hungry, so they proceeded to dress the birds, build a bonfire, cut fork sticks to roast the quail. As they sat around the fire, mouse watering, smelling the meat, getting closer to time to eat, Granddad decided, Hey, I've got to do something here, or I will only get one and one-fourth quails to eat, and I'm... I'm just hungry. I'm doggone hungry. What could I do? Oh, yes, the fellas sure won't touch those birds if I spit on them. So, yep, you guessed it. No one would touch them, and he had six whole birds to eat. Wow. Well, that's the end of the story for today. I hope you enjoyed it. And next week, we will go to the next story of Elizabeth Ann Reinhardt and growing up in Mooresville, North Carolina. You have a wonderful evening. Thank you for watching Karen Corner. Make sure you head over to our Facebook and YouTube channel where you will find this program along with others. Be sure that you subscribe, like, and click the notification bell so that you will receive notifications for our weekly program. Don't forget to share this program to your social media platforms. If there's a question that you would like to ask, make sure to email it to caringcorner22 at gmail.com. We hope to see you on the next episode of Caring Corner.